Hi folks, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about complex one of the electron transport chain. Uh, complex one uh, is the first enzyme of the electron transport chain and it's responsible for effectively taking the electrons from NADH uh, in the mitochondrial matrix. So these are ones that are produced through the Krebs cycle for example, uh, and then adding these onto a molecule called coenzyme Q or ubiquinol ubiquinone. Okay. Uh, ubiquinone is a membrane soluble or fatty, acid, fatty soluble uh, electron carrier and effectively what this does is it hands off uh, from NADH to uh, make QH2 or ubiquinol. Um, and of course, this is still on the matrix side. Um, and so this is really a way of taking some of those matrix NADHs that we've been making in abundance through both the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, uh, which generates an, two NADHs per glucose, uh, as well as through the Krebs cycle and uh, through some other pathways as well, any matrix NADH can be made into a membrane soluble uh, QH2, uh, which is going to be very useful for the next enzymes in the chain. And so if I'm to label this kind of diagram, you can see it kind of has a membrane bound piece and then this kind of large lobe that hangs down into the mitochondrial matrix. Um, this side is the matrix. And out here is the inner membrane space. And then of course, this is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're taking those matrix NADHs um, right down here and we're passing electrons essentially up this lobe and eventually up to the membrane where these membrane bound Qs, they're fat soluble, they're in the membrane, will pick up those electrons. Now, if you remember um, from our discussions earlier in the term, uh, NAD and NADH are obligate two electron carriers. Which means that they have to do twos. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of the things that are going on in the electron transport chain, um, the wiring that moves the electrons up through this lobe um, is actually only one electron at a time. Right? So here we're moving two electrons into this chain, but the wires are so are set up because they're essentially iron uh, atoms, a chain of iron atoms, um, that only allow one at a time. And so the first thing we're actually going to be doing in this uh, enzyme is to be handing it off to something that can do uh, one or two electron transfers. Something that has a stable radical intermediate. Uh, and this is the flavins, okay? So we've talked about FAD before, uh, but the other flavins uh, like FMN are, are essentially the structurally the exact same thing. So ultimately we're gonna be going through two phases. We're gonna be transferring the electrons from NADH these hydrogens here, onto FMN. So I'm gonna draw this out here. Uh, the only difference between FAD and FMN is the dinucleotide or mononucleotide. Um, that's the difference. Um, there's just another nucleotide on there. Um, and so they have functionally have the same chemistry. The same uh, electron pushes are gonna be happening um, on FMN versus NADH. Okay. So we're going to be pushing those electrons here onto FMN to generate FMNH2 and NAD+. And FMNH2. 
And then we can start, because this was a two electron transfer, uh, now NAD is free to go, but FMN is gonna start to trickle one electron at a time onto what's called the iron sulfur relay, which essentially is like the, the, uh, the wiring of the complex one. Um, and it's essentially gonna be taking one electron um, and putting it onto iron sulfur clusters. Okay. It's gonna be trickling these down one electron at a time. And to do that, it's gonna be making a semi-quinone intermediate. So this is FMNH dot. Okay. So for example, we'll lose a hydrogen here um, and we'll have a resonance stabilized semiquinone or radical intermediate, FMN H dot. And then we could drop another electron onto the iron sulfur relay to go back to FMN. So we have this nice little three part equilibrium going on here. Of course, this uh, radical is stabilized by resonance. Um, and so we're gonna be trickling these onto the clusters. And in the next phase of the reaction, we are going to be uh, using that cluster to be loading on to something called uh, coenzyme Q. Uh, and I'll show, I'll show you that here in just a second. So where we just ended uh, was here. So this is the phase one, I guess. This would be the NADH to FMN, and then dropping onto the iron sulfur relays. So that would be uh, what I call phase one. And then phase two is gonna be this piece right here, where the iron sulfur relay is going to be dropping electrons one at a time onto another uh, complex, or I guess another molecule that has uh, semi-quinone intermediates, and that's Q. Okay, and Q looks like this. The quinone essentially has this long branchy chain piece that makes this lipid soluble. This is coenzyme Q. This is ubiquinone. Okay. And so we're going to be dropping an electron onto this. We're going to be going from, I suppose, a two plus iron to a three plus iron. Uh, and we're going to be dropping an electron here onto ubiquinone. Okay. So that's going to essentially be rearranging our pair and then dropping a radical into the ring to be res resonance stabilized. Okay. So we're going to be generating our UQ dot or UQH dot. Okay. As we form this pair of electrons, it's going to attack hydrogen. And so we're going to end up with a OH on one side of the ring. And then we're going to have the formation of a radical on the other side. Okay. And this can be resonance stabilized throughout the ring. Um, and now this would be our semi-quinone intermediate. And so we're dropping one electron at a time onto this. And this essentially is what we call a redox loop. You can see how it's drawn as a circle here. I guess this would be UQ dot, the way I have it drawn. Um, you, or a Q, I guess we would have a coenzyme Q, and then UQH dot as part of this, and then UQH2. And as we do that, we're loading up hydrogens from the matrix. And then we're gonna get loaded up a second time to uh, drop another iron, two plus to three plus off the iron sulfur relay. Remember we're trickling one electron in at a time from the FMNH2. Uh, and so this time we're gonna be dropping uh, that free radical down here onto this guy to pair up that radical. And then we're gonna attack another hydrogen and we're gonna be forming QH2. And again, this is membrane soluble. So this is gonna then be able to go through the membrane to find other members of the complex of the electron transport chain. And I just have this drawn kind of scattered. Um, it is longer, it's like usually a 15 uh, units long of a long, long tail that makes this membrane soluble. Uh, and now what's gonna happen is um, that redox loop is gonna be used to pump hydrogens out, okay? 
Um, so we're gonna be doing this kind of back and forth. And notice what happens here is we get two hydrogens pumped from the redox loop. And those are pumped from the matrix side into the IMS, okay? And this is a huge, huge concept in the electron transport chain because getting those hydrogens to pump uh, is the whole basis for how we are able to generate ATP from the electron transport chain. Um, and what we're gonna do the second time is we're gonna be dropping those electrons from this guy onto another uh, QH2 through another relay. And so we have this little QH2 loop that essentially is like a little bit of a buffer. If you can think about that, this is soaking up electrons and kind of freeing things out of the, um, the, the iron sulfur relay. And so we have a little nice redox loop here. Um, and so we're gonna be dropping back as we go through these, kind of going back towards these, we're gonna be dropping back onto the iron sulfur relay. Um, again, we'll be dropping onto the, the second iron sulfur relay. You can see it has two FES clusters. Um, and then we're gonna be going back onto a QH2 again. So this redox loop is simply a proton pump. So phase three would be uh, QH2 onto iron sulfur and then back onto another QH2 in the membrane. So this essentially, you could think about this being a captive QH2. Um, this is stuck in the enzyme. It's kind of cycling around and used to pump protons out. And then the second part of that is gonna pump a second set of hydrogens. And so based on the adding of electrons onto those iron sulfur centers, what we're gonna have happen here is essentially opening of these channels. And so that's kind of what I have drawn here uh, is we have some hydrogens that are pumped through these channels based on uh, the, you know, the, the change in those hydrogens and the change in the shape as the electrons pass. You can imagine a little bit of a, a zap going through the molecule. Uh, and so we end up with four hydrogens pumped out at this phase. And that is, that is this, essentially the big picture. Um, we, we end up with that NADH being made into QH2, though it's much more complicated. Uh, we pass two electrons off, again, through this complicated relay, um, but also we pump four H plus into the intermembrane space from the matrix. Okay. And again, some major concepts about this uh, are the fact that we have to kind of translate our mandatory two electron stream from NADHs into a flexible one or two electron stream. Um, and both QH2 can do that. Um, but FMN is a prosthetic group, which means it's physically bound to the enzyme. And so it's kind of always there when you need it. That FMN H2 is always gonna be there when you need it to be. And so it can always be accepting hydrogens uh, from NADH. Um, and it can pass those off into the relay uh, kind of trickling them in and kind of holding on to those uh, until they can be passed off. So essentially it's kind of like take a number at the DMV. You take a number, uh, they wait for you to, your number to be called and then essentially the next one is able to go and it just kind of trickles through, right? And then this whole system ends up pumping those four hydrogens out. Okay? So that's kind of the big picture here with uh, coenzyme Q uh, and complex one. And as we talked about in a previous one, this enzyme and Complex, complex two from the Krebs cycle, both end up putting in uh, the electrons onto coenzyme Q. And we'll see later in the electron transport chain where those end up at complex three. Um, so as long, hopefully you have a good picture of what's going on with complex one here. So one last thing, I wanna kind of point out some of the commonalities we see for these iron sulfur clusters. Some of the neat shapes you might see, here's a two iron, two sulfur cluster, a three iron, four sulfur cluster and a four iron, four sulfur cluster. Uh, if you've ever seen Fool's Gold, uh, iron pyrite, uh, iron pyrite is a iron sulfide. It's a complex of Fe and S, uh, and it gets this kind of, it, they're, they're a good match. And in the same way that iron and oxygen would be a good match, uh, it's still oxidized iron, but sulfur and oxygen are closely related. And so irons and sulfurs really end up liking each other quite a lot. Um, but uh, Sulfur is not quite as electronegative, so that helps the iron to be more of a redox able species instead of using iron oxides. But notice here that complex one has quite a lot of iron sulfur clusters involved in it. Complex two has quite a lot of iron sulfur clusters. Complex three also has some iron sulfur clusters. 
um, in the Rieske complex, but then uh, com by the com time you get to complex four, we've switched out of iron and onto copper, though we use some still iron here in the cytochromes, okay? Um, and so this idea of iron sulfur relays is a very common one in, uh, in the electron transport chain. Uh, and so we're gonna see that kind of over and over as essentially, again, the wires where electrons actually move through. Um, you know, copper is a common wiring system even in our houses today. Um, it transmits electrons really well. Iron as well, but um, you know, in a wire in our wall, we don't want rust to happen. Um, whereas in our body, we have ways of, of undoing them. Okay? So keep that in mind that these iron sulfur clusters are super useful and they're super common. Okay, so let's think about kind of some of the things that are happening here at complex one, which has another name, NADH CoQ oxidoreductase or NADH dehydrogenase. That's my favorite version of this. Up to this point, everything that we've seen as dehydrogenases has pretty much been making NADH or a version of NADH and ADPH. Um, but it's about time NADH gets dehydrogenated itself and that happens at complex one. But notice here, uh, we're looking at reduction potentials. Uh, and essentially what the electron transport chain is doing, if you recall, is funneling electrons eventually down here onto oxygen. Oxygen has a very positive reduction potential, which means it's very accepting of electrons. It wants to be reduced very heavily. In fact, it's one of the most reducible species in biochemistry, the, perhaps the most naturally occurring reducible species, wants to accept electrons. And remember, if you uh, think back on some of the electrochemistry we did earlier, positive E values mean that that's a favorable reaction. Remember from uh, delta G, negative N, F, delta E. Uh, delta E, we want that to be positive. Um, the more positive the value is, the more likely it is to be accepting those electrons, which makes a positive charge in solution, of course, which means the electrons are flowing. Uh, regardless, essentially what we want to do here is we want to take a little, a few baby steps through the electron transport chain, because if we jump right here from NADH all the way to oxygen, uh, we have a massive E value, and that's going to give off a huge amount of free energy that we really can't harness, right? It'd be too much power for one, one uh, complex to harness, right? And let me look at the math here. Uh, if we wanted to do that, we would have to leave our 0.18815 from oxygen reduction. And then we're gonna be oxidizing NADH, so we're gonna be adding 0.315 um, to that. Um, so putting those together, we're gonna to have those added and we're gonna end up with 1.13 volts of delta E. Right. Um, and if we convert that negative N F delta E, uh, if we do two electrons here, or four electrons even, because oxygen needs four to be fully reduced, uh, we would get negative four times 96 and a half kilojoules per mole volt times 1.13 volts. Uh, we're going to end up with quite a large free energy change here. Let me make sure I get the math right. 1.13 times four times 1.1 uh, times 96.5. 436 kilojoules per mole. Kilojoules of free energy released. If we go jump right from NADH onto oxygen, which is possible, um, we're gonna give a, a huge amount of free energy, but there's no way we could contain that energy. And so instead of taking this enormous jump um, here, right, this is our four electrons uh, onto uh, oxygen and then our Faraday's constant and our volts. Instead of doing that, we're gonna take some baby steps. So we're gonna be going onto FMN and then onto this relay, onto this iron sulfur relay, and eventually we're gonna be landing on coenzyme Q, okay? And so we're channeling those electrons through this channel to kind of get as much energy as we can out of it. Uh, recall here that coenzyme Q is here at 0.0405, which means it's more reducible than NADH, so it's spontaneously flowing electrons down here onto coenzyme Q. But in this case, uh, if we're not going, if we're going NADH onto CoQ, we're gonna be having uh, the CoQ go reduce, so it's gonna be 0.045 volts. And then we're gonna have to flip it, NADH to oxidize it, plus one, 
315 volts. So we're going to end up with 0.36 volts. And in this case, we only need two electrons, so we're going to have 296.5 and 0.36 volts. So let's check what the math looks like on that. It's 69 kilojoules per mole. Negative 69 there. Oops. And that's harnessable, right? We can do that. That's about two ATPs worth of free energy that's given. Um, now, whether we can actually use all that free energy is a different matter, but it is a lot less waste than what we were seeing over here with the negative 436 kilojoules, which mostly would be wasted as heat. In this case, we're going to be able to use some of that to generate potentials that we can use to cash in for ATP by taking baby steps, right? The same things are going to happen here for complex two at succinate. Succinate is going to be channeling through an FAD relay, through an FAD, uh, through an iron sulfur uh, handoff relay, and then onto coenzyme Q again, which is going to help us kind of step down the energy of these high energy intermediates, eventually landing them onto complex three and complex four, which is going to, again, help us get more of this harvestable energy that we want instead of wasting it.